I want to go to this. This is a very serious topic. Oregon State Police taser autistic child found wandering naked. Now, this is a situation. I just want to read this, uh, this quote right here. The girl's father also took issue to KDRV's reportage, which frequently referred to the girl as a young woman, a woman and a juvenile. Now, this is an 11-year-old girl who was found wandering naked uh, down the highway. A, a gentleman, uh, I believe he was a taxi driver, pulled up beside her and said, Hey, are you okay? Are you lost? Are you like, what, what's going on here? And the girl doesn't listen to him. She just keeps walking down the street. She turns out to be autistic and has uh, communication issues. The gentleman, cab driver, calls the police. The police come up. And just like you see there, they tase the girl and then put her on the hood of a car like she's in some type of drug buster. They thought she was running guns or something. And, uh, yeah, that, that's the taxi driver right there giving his testimony. And you can go to Infowars.com and see that video for yourself. But we actually have the girl's father who's going to be joining us. His name is Aram. He's very emotional and um, rightly so. You know, this guy has every right to be outraged. This is a horrible situation because we see the situations where they taser people for noncompliance, tase people who have seizures and tase people who don't want to stand up or sit down or whatever the, the drill may be at the time. And then they just tase this person and think they did the right thing. So we're going to have him. He joins us right now via Skype. All right. Thanks for joining us, Aaron. And thank you for having me. Now, I know this is a very difficult time and you got a lot of emotions and I understand you've been talking to some other news agencies. So definitely want you at your best. You just let it fly. Tell us what happened. You receive, I'm guessing, a phone call telling you this has happened to your daughter. Yeah, well, what happened is, uh, well, obviously, it was the middle of the night we were sleeping. We, uh, the phone was ringing at 6.30 in the morning. Um, and we got a call saying that uh, we have your daughter down at the uh, Rogue Valley Medical Center here in Southern Oregon. And uh, we're like, what in the world? And so we run in the room, we're like, it's gotta be a mistake. And sure enough, she's not there. Um, and uh, so we're like, holy crap, you know? Um, she she's, has escaped before, but never in this manner. Um, it's typical of autistic kids, or certain autistic kids to boogie. You know, they just like to get out and right. go for an adventure and once they, put their line of sight down a direction, they just keep going. So we're like, holy crap. So we go down there, and once we get her, we find out that uh, the state police, um, in the uh, process of apprehending her, had to tase her two times. Oh, my God. Now, before, let's just talk about the tasering, okay? So your daughter, she's walking down the street. I saw the, the video with the cab driver, I believe it was. He was the witness of the thing. He says, your daughter's walking down the street. She's not you know, hindering anybody, you know, of course, it's a very unsafe situation for anybody to be, not just a child. But so the police approach your daughter, they issue two verbal commands, if I'm correct, and then fire on her with a taser. Is that correct, sir? That is correct. But also, I mean, she was in a non-threatening manner. She was giggling. She wasn't uh, in a, you know... Uh, she wasn't aggressive. She wasn't aggressive. She wasn't in some agitated state. She was giggling. And I mean, I can picture, I know my daughter, she was probably running down the road thinking it was the best thing in the world, you know? Mm -hmm. She was probably, the cab driver said she was giggling, and that's just typical. She just thinks this is really cool. Um, so when the uh, state police pull up, rather than approach the situation uh, in trying to apprehend her, you know, physically, and it's obvious she has no weapons. It's, it's obvious she's not a threat. They give her two verbal commands and then taser. And then once they tased her, she obviously got excited. Right. And then they had to tase her again. Is she on the ground? Does she go down with the first taser? She went down. And then they tried to apprehend her. But once, you know, the taser comes out, she got scared. And she's, she, a lot of autistic kids have a lot of strength. Mm -hmm. They have kind of an abnormal amount of strength, especially when you're excited. When you get hit with a taser, your adrenaline starts pumping. You know, prior to that, she was uh, giggling. But then they had to physically apprehend her. They had to get uh, other help. They did the normal, uh, you know, like they're apprehending a dangerous criminal. Right. They slammed her head on the hood of the car, handcuffed her, threw her in the back of the uh, police car when she would have gone voluntarily. I know my mm -hmm. daughter, she loves cars. If you anybody drives up to her, if she's walking along, she just hops right in the car because she loves cars. That's one of her characteristics, you know, of her particular 
view of just their characteristic. Now, I want to yes. ask you because you have a, I'm pretty sure you can get a lot of people talking negatively about you and your family saying, well, what was this girl doing outside at this hour anyway, especially with no clothes on? How did this situation come about? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's not the first time. It's not the first time. Uh, she is very well known with the local police and uh, uh, emergency services. Um, and also with uh, the community, everyone knows her. Um, they know her characteristics, so it wasn't uh, within the community. And also, uh, she uh, is involved in state, uh, state custody with the DHS or CPS. Mm -hmm. um, for more of on a services level rather than them trying to take her, um, which they do want to do. They want to put her in an institution eventually, I'm pretty sure. Have but, they uh, told you this before that they want to take her, or is that your observation? No, th that's uh, their intent eventually, I'm sure. Um, and that was their intent a long time ago, but um, we provided a safe environment um, for her, and uh, we've had her all her life. She's never actually been in a foster home or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But um, there has been various uh, foster homes uh, kind of salivating at getting a hold of her because they can get a lot of money for having them or of course, of course, having yeah. her in their care because she's an extra special needs child and they can get a lot of money if she goes in one of those foster homes. Exactly. Now let's talk about her condition at the time. So she's out walking around and she happens to be nude. Is this something unusual for your daughter? No, not at all. Not at all. No, that's absolutely normal. I know it sounds strange to a lot of people, but uh, she has a sensory thing about her skin. She takes her clothes off all the time, and that's one of the problems with her being in an institution is that... Uh, well, that'd be a real problem if she was taken to an institution, a, uh, a juvenile center, lo and behold, a jail. Uh, they're going to have this person who doesn't want to keep their clothes on, and that's going to be a real problem. It's going to be a real problem because most of these institutions that they keep these kids in are also, uh, you know, you, you got to worry about the staff. You got to worry about the other, you know, the other clients. Um, it's a real problem. She's a lot better off at home than an institution. I can guarantee you that and a lot safer, mm -hmm. even though these things might happen. But they're still going to have the same problems in, a, in an institution unless they lock her down completely and basically in prison. Mm -hmm. So in some people's argument as well, it's better to imprison her and save her life than let her have a life with her family and you know have some risks there's going to be risks with a child like this wherever they are mm -hmm. um and uh it's uh, it's a struggle we had an emergency meeting about it um with the state and the state has actually been pretty supportive um i'm not sure if it's because they don't know where to place her and right. they don't have the funding or if it's because they're generally concerned um i'm hoping that it's there, there, over time, there has been a community of people like her teachers and uh, a community of people that have really kind of surrounded her and uh, supported Support us. Her. Yeah, and supported us uh, against the state because I've had experience with the state uh, on this level of DHS. It's here in Oregon, but it's you know, basically CPS. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, that's kept her safe is a lot of that community support and outrage because um, this has happened before and uh, but not to this extent where police were involved with tasers and so forth yeah not in the middle of the night and not naked yeah. But, yeah now is your daughter at home with you right now is she uh back safe sound is she in custody where is she at this moment uh, she's, uh, she's at grandma's right now okay so she's at least in your custody she's not of the state yeah. right now no okay. no she's in her custody yep. okay now, I want to ask you, sir, this is obviously something that's very uh, near and dear to your heart, something that you are very emotional about. Uh, let's say, lo and behold, one of these incidents happens to happen again. What do you think would happen? Even if it's not on this level that the police were involved, you're saying that you know, they're itching to take your child away. Do you think they may try to take your child away? Well, I think one of the problems, um, I think they would have done so if she wasn't such a unique uh, case and they can find a place to put her but I think uh, eventually there are various institutions um, and they have been expressed to us that want her um, and there are a few different uh, facilities that like I said are kind of salivating to get a kid like this because they can get so many resources for this job and uh, once they get her of course you know they're gonna drug her up and basically imprison her oh yeah 
and get a lot of federal receipts and state receipts for having her. So to uh, other parties, you know, she's a kind of a gold mine, you know, until for the rest of her life, basically. Right. Right. Uh, and facilities do not have the same patience and understanding that a family member has when she has an outburst. Mm -hmm. uh, she is very you know, strong. Um, she does trapeze. She's very physically fit. Um, and she does have outbursts where she, you know, she'll scratch you or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then her uh, physical safety becomes an issue. Even though she's a child and she may lash out, then she has to deal with a adult supervisor. And I know your time is short, and also this is very emotional for you. So we're going to wrap this thing up. And also I believe we're going to have you on the Alex Jones radio show pretty soon. But I just want to ask you this question. What do you think about the local news coverage? Could I watch the clip where they were interviewing the, uh, the cab driver, and they kept referring to your daughter as a young woman or a juvenile? Your daughter is 11 years old. Is that correct? Yeah, she's 11 years old, and that wasn't the first time. We'd already complained about it in the, uh, when we read the first emergency services article in the paper at, where they referred to her as a late teen mm -hmm. and a woman. And we called up and said, look, this is not a woman. This is a, not only an 11-year-old kid, but a handicapped kid at that. Right. And uh, they followed up with a, new, or a news segment where they still called her a woman. Mm -hmm. Now, the last time I checked, an 11-year-old kid is not a woman, especially one that is handicapped. Right. Handicapped. So it seems to me like they're, they want to call her a woman to somehow kind of create an atmosphere where it's okay to tase an 11-year-old kid. You no, 11-year-old is not a child. It's not even a teen. And they have the audacity to call her a young woman, a woman, uh, I guess in some reports put it, a juvenile, so forth, but she's an 11-year-old little girl. She's a little yeah. girl. She's a little girl, and mentally, she's even littler. You know, I mean, <laughs> she's not a woman by any stretch of the imagination. Exactly. Now, I know your time is short. Can you just give us your closing thoughts? Well, I think that uh, police training has really gotten to this level where they don't, they, don't, they don't really care about who they're interacting with. They mm -hmm. just react uh, in whatever is the most convenient, easiest way to deal with whatever they're dealing with. And if that means tasing or shooting them with a gun, then that's just how they react. And police never uh, are concerned with dealing with people as people. They look at everybody as a potential criminal that might hurt them, so it's better to shoot them first rather than kind of be uh, diplomatic and deal with the situation. It's just just... Oh, here's someone that's naked running down the road, tase. And if that didn't work, you know, what, would they have shot her? Isn't the taser the uh, primary barrier between shooting? So what's next? You know, if that didn't work. Uh, uh, police tactics really need to get some additional training on uh, dealing with uh, handicapped kids because there are thousands and thousands of kids, just like my daughter across this country right now. Right. Uh, autism is an epidemic. Now, let, me, let me, I know I, I said that's the last question, but let me ask you this. Because you'll get a lot of critics out there and say, well, they tased her, but he would have thrown a fit had the cops come up and maybe grabbed her or put their hands on her. How do you think the situation should have been resolved? She didn't like that. I mean, she's not afraid of strangers. She doesn't, she doesn't care about if you're a stranger or whatever. You can walk up, grab her hand, and get her in the car. No problem. So she you would have been perfectly fine if the officer, you know, even if she was uh, non-compliant verbally, which you, you say she has difficulties in that area, but the officer came, took her by the hand, maybe even you know, gently nudged her by the shoulder, said, hey, get into this police car. Would you be fine with that scenario? Well, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy that she's home safe, even though she was tased. I'm just happy that she's home safe. So it's kind of a mixed emotional thing. It's like, okay, well, if you had to tase her to save her life, okay, fine, I'm just glad she's home and she's safe and I'm appreciative that the police were there. I mean, when you need the police and they're there, it's a wonderful thing. But uh, some of their tactics and training uh, really need some work. Uh, you know, I, it, it's mixed emotions. I, you know. Right. Well, I got you and I definitely appreciate your time. and look forward to seeing you on the Alex Jones radio show very soon. All right. Thanks, Shikari. All right. Thank you, Aaron. And there he goes. And like I said, he will be joining us on the Alex Jones radio show very soon. So be sure to tune in for that. Now we're going to go to a clip. This is a clip a caller called in. He said, hey, have you guys seen this? This is Senator Rockefeller at a roast of Pat Buchanan saying, hey, uh, you need to join the New World Order. You know, I think Pat's coming quickly. Soon I think he's going to be in a position for the Trilateral Commission. 
<laughs> and if he shows promise beyond that, there's Bilderberg. <laughs> World control, Pat. <laughs> Settle for nothing else. People were laughing at these very unfunny jokes. I had to laugh because nothing he said was funny, not even like being dead serious. He just wasn't funny. I guess they had the big uh, telescreens, applause, laugh, or whatever it said. And I'm very curious. Uh, I believe we're to the point now where the mainstream media admits that there is a Bilderberg. This guy was joking about it back in 1991. Uh, not just that, but the Trilateral Commission, which I, I hope people accept the Trilateral lateral commission of actually existing but this man was making jokes about it back in 1991 but it never existed until you know BBC decided to make fun of Alex Jones for covering it but that's the media coverage we're dealing with now we're going out to our quote of the day this is a very good quote uh, John Bowne found this it's really pretty good let's take a look this is from Michael Hastings the simple and terrifying reality forbidden from discussion in America was that despite spending $600 billion a year on the military, despite having the best fighting force in the world has ever known, they were getting their asses kicked by illiterate peasants who made bombs out of manure and wood. That by Michael Hastings. And he makes a very good point here because people think about AK-47s, AR-15, small arms as they're called, and they say, well, you can't defend yourself from a foreign government or maybe even a local government using these things. Let's say uh, if, if uh, Russia decided hey, we just want to come in and storm Florida for whatever reason. They say the people in Florida can't defend themselves with AK-47s and AR-15s because what if the Russians have drones or they have tanks or they have this or they have that. Think about people in Afghanistan, people in Iraq who are using old busted up AK-47s that lo and behold still work but they're able to fight off this, uh, this threat using these you know, outdated weapons, because it's not so much the weapon, it's the holder and also the intent of the person. Because you think about a, uh, a occupying army, this is their GI Bill. This is how they're going to send their kids to school, uh, you know, right to retirement fund or whatever else. When you go and occupy somebody's country, you're living in their backyard. So when you build this big giant base, like, hey, man, my goat should be out there grazing across the field over there. That you just built your big thing on it. Then you shot my uncle last week because he was wearing the wrong kind of thing on his head. The people get mad about this kind of stuff, and they have a will to fight, and it works well, great for the people in Afghanistan and all these other places. The Syrian rebels, which I don't support one bit, but you see these guys out there being effective with their AK-47, so uh, those things obviously work and are able to keep people at bay. But yet, I digress. We have reached the end of the show, or at least the end of the news portion of the show, and keep in mind, Operation Paul Revere is still going on. Well, the submissions are over, let me be clear about that, but we're still in the judging process. So be encouraged. I believe they're going to announce it, actually, the winners at the end of July. So stay tuned for that. We'll be doing updates and having uh, more people on the show to talk about their great films and what motivated them to make them. So stay tuned for that. But the end of July, I believe, is the actual announcement for Operation Paul Revere. And also, that's a good thing, uh, you can go to Paul Revere, Paul Revere at Infowars.com and send us your favorite video. And we're requesting that you only send one video Per uh, email, you can send multiple emails if you choose, but we do ask you to narrow it down to at least your top two or three and just say, hey, I think this was best. And not just tell us what you think was best, but tell us why. I like this guy's cinematography, I like the message, or I liked uh, you know, the actors, or whatever it may be. Just send us your email and let us know, and we'll uh, take that all in consideration. Now, if you want to support this operation, go to prisonplanet.tv and get yourself a 15-day free trial. You can get it all right there, the Alex Jones Show, the rants, and so much more right there. Now stick around because after this we're going to have two very powerful interviews, one with Mike Cargill that I'm going to do and also Alex Jones' interview with Vigo Mortensen. That's right, the guy from the Lord of the Rings, the king in the Lord of the Rings. He called into the Alex Jones radio show today, so we're going to have that whole interview as well as Mike Cargill right after this. Now you can watch Alex Jones live at Infowars.com forward slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. You can also browse the network, the Infowars Nightly News, and over 60 movies and documentaries all together in one place. You can watch the Alex Jones Radio Show live as it happens. So check it out, Infowars.com forward slash show. The important thing about the Pro One filter today is that the material we use for removing fluoride and other heavy metals now will remove the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. 
There's no other fluoride reduction filter out there that will remove that type of fluoride. And it's extremely important because today we're hearing more and more cities are using that form of fluoride. We've been having medication forced on us through the water system for quite a while. Most people don't realize it. Most people don't realize the negative effects of fluoride. There's a wide range of health effects that are attributed to fluoride. Bottom line, why should somebody get this new Pro One Pro Pure filter? The reason to buy the Pro One, it's an all-in-one filter. It's convenient, easy to use. It doesn't require the add-on fluoride filter. And in addition, this filter removes the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid.